This morning we're going to be uh, looking at well, just a few verses. Um, I, I have as our text verse 15 of uh, John chapter 14, but I believe I wanted to read the, the whole section from verses 15 and following. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> so one thing I keep forgetting to check is what I've told them to display versus what I came out thinking that I'm going to read. Okay, so uh, I'd like to begin in verse 15 and read to the end of the chapter, verse 31. Um, what we're looking at is a theme that is woven through this particular section. And uh, everything else that is included here is what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. And that has to do with what the Lord was going to be doing for His disciples that was more than what He had already done, what was being done in the Old Covenant. Um, what the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was going to bring. But in order to receive that blessing and that power of the Holy Spirit, they needed to have this first prerequisite, this work of the Holy Spirit within their hearts that creates a love, that creates obedience. So let's read about that now and beginning in verse 15 of John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him, because He abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened? that you were going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You, said, you heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. Well, may the Lord bless uh, His word to our hearing this morning. Just want to remind you, we're going to be looking at that one theme that was woven through this passage, and that is, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my words. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now again, first by way of reminder, last week we saw Jesus telling His disciples that He was leaving that he was going away. And of course, that immediately struck fear into their hearts. But he told them not to be afraid. Not to be afraid because of all these things we've been looking at and particularly the fact that he was leaving to prepare a place for them in his father's house. Now remember, Jesus was saying many different things to comfort them. The fact that Jesus was, had just told them that he was bringing them to his, father house, his father's house seems to have made them a bit apprehensive because they really weren't, at least they didn't think, were very familiar with the Father. After all, what was he really like? Uh, Jesus said on one, of, on one occasion, no one had ever seen the Father. 
And the things that they thought they were familiar with with regard to the Father in the Old Testament was really the Lord Jesus appearing in what we call his pre-incarnate state. But what about the Father? Would he love them? Would he receive them? Now, again, we have shared a similar concern, I'm sure at least in some point of our lives, wondering what the Father was like. Is he that one that basically is, is coming after us in his justice and Jesus is the one standing before him saying, Father, don't kill them because I've died for them? Is that how we conceive of the Father? No, well, if we have, we're wrong. Jesus, remember, told us we have nothing to fear from him. Because the Father is the same as He is. Jesus says if we've seen Him, if we've known Him, we've also seen and known the Father. That they are the same. Now we know that they're not the same person, but they do have the same nature. They do share the same character. They have the same love and the same gracious purpose towards us. So don't think that Jesus alone loves you. It's not just Jesus, it's also His Father, it's also the Spirit who is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Now Jesus brought this out even more clearly by evoking that Jewish imagery of a husband returning to his father's house with his bride. Remember, that's the Jewish way of doing things. When Abraham wanted uh, to get a bride for his son Isaac, he sent his servant to a foreign land to bring a wife back to his son that he might live with him in his house. So we read the father sent his son into the world to redeem a bride to himself and then he sent his messengers out into the world to gather that bride together so that Jesus might bring her home to his father's house where he might love and cherish her forever. That is, he might love and cherish us. Now, Jesus is telling us that just as a bride is welcomed into the home of her husband's father, so we will be welcomed into the father's house because the father shares the same love for us that the son has. Remember, the father is the one whom Scripture says has loved us from all eternity. There was never a time when the father didn't love us and he is the one who has chosen us from all eternity to give us to his son as his bride. Now we saw Jesus also addressing another concern. If he was going to leave, then how were the disciples going to be able to continue the work that he had given them to do? They might have been able to do what needed to be done when Jesus was here. But how were they going to do it after he was gone? Well, Jesus told them that, that his leaving, far from being a problem to them, would actually end up in things getting better. Not only would they uh, be able to do what he had done and what, what he had done, basically what they had done on several occasions when he sent them out to teach and to preach, they were doing what Jesus did. But he said they would do greater things because he was going to the Father. Whatever they asked in his name, Jesus said, he would do. And so they asked, and the Lord very powerfully and graciously answered them and did greater things. Now again, remember the promise still applies to us. That promise Jesus made to his disciples applies to us because we are his disciples, because we have loved him and trusted him, because now we are the ones who are called upon to do his work. Jesus says, we may ask for anything, and he will answer us as long as what we ask for in His name is something that He really wants us to have, something that will bring glory to Him, something that will glorify His Father. And of course, that is what we will ask for if we truly love Him. Remember, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. If you love the Lord, you will ask for the things that you know He wants because you will want to please Him because you love him. Now, I brought that up simply to say this. This brings us to this morning's topic. If we love the Lord Jesus, we will ask for the things that he wants us to have. If we love the Lord Jesus, we will use this precious privilege that he has given to us in prayer to ask for the things that will glorify him. But if we love Jesus, 
we will also do what Jesus tells us that we will do. We will pay attention not only to the promises and seek for those things that, he, uh, that will glorify Him through the fulfillment of those promises, but we will pay attention to everything that He wants us to do in every area. Now, we know that it's important that we love the Lord, certainly when we consider that He has given us every reason to love Him. When we consider everything that He is, I mean, He is perfect. We sometimes, you know, find ourselves loving other people because of their character, because of certain characteristics, attributes about them, because of the way they look. There's a variety of things that might draw our affections out to someone else. But do you realize that Jesus is infinitely more beautiful in every way, in His character, and even in His glorious appearance? Uh, we love Him because of who He is. We love Him, of course, because also of what He has done for us. He's come into this world, taken our nature upon Himself, obeyed for us, died for us in order that we might have life. So we love Him. But now, how does He want us to show that love for Him? That's a question that we really do need to ask because is it enough simply to tell Him that we love Him? Now, He loves to hear the fact that we do, and He loves to hear us say that we do, but is that enough? Does He simply want to look into our hearts? And you know, the Lord is able, as, as Scripture tells us, He's the one who looks to and fro throughout the whole world, looking for the one whose heart is completely His. He can see what's in our hearts. Is it enough that the Lord looks and He sees that we have this affection in our hearts for Him? Now, to see it there certainly does please Him. But again, is that all He wants? We might ask ourselves the same questions. What is it that we like to see from those who say they love us? Is it enough that they simply tell us that they love us? Well, it's nice to hear the words, but you know that words can be cheap. I think we would rather see expressions of that love, the evidence that it really exists in them, that they really do love us. You know, it's interesting, Jesus wants to see exactly the same thing. He doesn't just want to hear it, He just doesn't want to see it in our hearts to know that it's there, but He wants to see it worked out in the way that we live. This morning, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So first of all, let's consider what it is our lives say about our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, are we keeping the commandments? Now, this is the way that we know that we love the Lord Jesus. And whether we love Him is really the most important question that we can ever ask ourselves in this life and answer. Not just so that we will know that the Lord will hear our prayers and answer our prayers, but for our eternal well-being because of the connection between love and salvation. Jesus tells us that if we do not love Him, that we really do not belong to Him. If we do not love Him, our sins have really not been forgiven. If we do not love Him, if we're not reflecting that character of love, of holiness, which is uh, really universal in the family of God, we have not been adopted into God's family. Jesus reproved the Jews on one occasion for their not loving Him, pointing to that as an indication that they really did not love the Father either. In John 8, verse 42, If God were your Father, you would love Me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. Our love for Jesus is the evidence that we actually know Him. And Jesus goes beyond that. He tells us in Matthew 10, verse 37, that it isn't a question of whether we love Him at all, but whether we love Him most of all. He said to His disciples before He sent them out to teach and preach in the towns and villages around 
Palestine, certainly because of what it was going to cost them, but also because of what they were to be looking for in those who were converted by their message. How were they going to know that these people actually received the gospel? Well, he says in Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The kind of love that Jesus wants and the kind that he actually gives in the gospel is the kind of love that puts him first over everything, over everyone, over those who are the nearest and dearest to us in the world, and of course, if over them, certainly over the things that are far less important. It's important that we love Jesus, and it's important that we love him most of all. We do need to realize that it was because we loved Jesus that we actually trusted Him and received Him and embraced Him as our Lord and Savior and our only hope of heaven in the first place. We never would have done it if we did not love Him. It's that love which the Lord gives to us through the gospel by His Holy Spirit is the reason why we, don't, we didn't stop where so many people stop today, being satisfied merely with knowing the story, knowing the facts of who Jesus is, of what He's done. Now, we do need to know these things. We need to know them in order to be saved, but we are not saved simply by knowing them. I mean, if we know these things but never actually believe them, if we never actually act upon them, then we're really no different than the liberal scholars who spend their whole lives getting, you know, not just earning a PhD, as it were, in a specific study of the New Testament, the Old Testament, becoming experts, knowing far more than we will ever know about it. The thing is that that knowledge does them no good unless they actually love Jesus, unless they actually embrace Jesus. So love is what pushes us beyond that. Love is why we are never satisfied with merely believing that everything we read in the Bible is actually true. Now, we do need to believe it in order to be saved, but we're not saved merely by believing the facts. You know, so many people today, again, I bring that up often because so many people today believe that's all you need. You just need to believe that what the Bible says is true about Jesus. He lived, He died on the cross, and I believe that, so I'm saved. But you know what? James tells us the demons also believe that. They know that all those things are true, but they're not saved. They they're, they shudder because they're afraid of what that means for them because they're going to perish forever, but they're not saved. And the reason is because they do not love the Lord and they haven't trusted Jesus Christ. And we do have to take into account the fact that the Lord never actually gave His Son to be a Savior to the angels as He has given Him to be a Savior to us. Love is the reason why we embraced Jesus as our Savior. The reason why we applied Him to our souls by faith when He offered Himself to us in the gospel and even why we received Him as our Lord and willingly bowed the knee to Him because this was the kind of king that we actually wanted. But now how can we know that that truly was the reason that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, especially when people seem to receive Him and then eventually fall away from Him. You know, there's other reasons why people receive Christ or think that they trust in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's because they grow up in a church and everybody around them is making a profession of faith and they say they love the Lord Jesus. And so they want to say it too because they don't want to be left out. They don't want to be th you know, thought of as outside the group. So they throw their lot in as well, and they say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Or maybe something happens in their life. They get you know, stricken with some kind of disease, like cancer. Maybe they get into a war, and they're afraid they're going to die, you see. Well, we call that a foxhole conversion. Fear kind of forces them to the Lord Jesus. I'm sure you've asked yourself this question. I have. Do I really, am I really trusting Jesus for the right reasons? Is it really because of love that I've trusted Him? Or is it because of fear? Or is it because of conformity? Is it because I want to believe that I am on my way to heaven? Well, how can we know that it was for love 
that we embraced Him. Well, Jesus tells us in our passage, we can know because we continue to love Him through our obedience. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We can know because the Bible tells us that the love that Jesus gives us for him by his Holy Spirit is a transforming love, one that actually works from within to make us like Jesus. Now, if we were to ask the question, you know, Jesus says, I love the Father. How do we know that Jesus really loved his Father? Well, we can know because he obeyed him. Jesus says in verse 31, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. And what did the Father command him to do? Everything that he had already done, but what he was referring to specifically was the fact that he was going to the cross. That was Jesus' ultimate display of his love towards his Father. Now, if we love the Lord Jesus, we will do exactly the same thing. We will obey him. Now, if we don't obey Him, what does that say about us? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 24, He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. If we don't obey Him, we don't love Him. And of course, if we don't love Him and if we don't obey Him, what does that say about our spiritual state and our eternal destination? Well, Jesus tells us that those who do not obey Him because they do not love Him will not enter into heaven. We already saw that Jesus said that to the Jews. You, if, you know, you, if you love the Father, you would love Me. If you don't love Me, you don't love the Father. Well, if you don't obey Jesus, you don't love Him. But what happens if you don't obey Him? Well, He says in Matthew 7, verse 21, some very sobering words. Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Jesus was not speaking to a group of legalistic Jews, telling them how they could be saved in the Old Covenant, as some would describe Jesus as speaking. Jesus was talking about kingdom principles. He was talking about the New Covenant. He was talking about what would be true of those who actually trusted in Him, who loved Him. They would obey Him. Now, we have to remember here, obedience, our obedience is not what saves us. That's not what Jesus is saying. But what it does is show that we have loved Him and that we have believed and trusted in the only one who actually can save us. Again, obedience, sanctification, holiness, Christ-likeness is the fruit. It is the result of trusting in Jesus. It is not what saves us. We're not working our way to heaven, but it is the result of our salvation. It is the fruit of our salvation. It shows that we have trusted Jesus. Now, let's, let's just stop here and apply this for a few moments. First of all, let's ask this question. <laughs> if obedience is how we can know that we are really, that we, you know, whether or not we really love Jesus, we need to ask ourselves whether or not we're being obedient, whether or not we are keeping His commandments, whether we are actually seeking to live by the standard that Jesus lived by. Remember, Jesus kept His Father's commandments. He kept them in order to save us. He kept them to fulfill the righteousness of them so He might give, them, give that righteousness to us as a free gift. He kept them as an example to us. And in the New Covenant, He actually takes that law by His Holy Spirit and He writes it into our minds and puts them upon our hearts. Is that law in our minds? Are we thinking about it? Has that law been written on our hearts? Well, do we love it and are we submitting to it? Do our lives show that these things are true by our following Jesus' example? Remember, Jesus said on more than one occasion that a tree is known by its fruit. 
What does the fruit of our lives say about us? You've heard this analogy, if we were put on trial in, in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict us as being Christians or would we be exonerated? Well, in this particular trial, we need to be convicted of being Christians if we are to see heaven. Now, let's delve into this just a little bit more deeply and taking it from the, the standpoint of what the Lord tells us is the, the goal or the purpose of redemption. It is that we might become like Jesus, that His image might actually be formed in us. Now, if our Lord's image is being formed in us, then shouldn't we want to obey the Lord Jesus in the same way that He obeyed His Father? And that's the question we need to ask about our own experience, about our own lives. Now, how much did Jesus love His Father? Well, Jesus showed the strength of His love by the thoroughness of His obedience. Now, we realize we're not going to be able to match the intensity of Jesus' love for His Father. We are not going to be able to obey God's commandments with the precision that Jesus obeyed, but... If we love Jesus, that is what we will aim for. Remember, the standard is perfection. The standard is not what my neighbor can do. It's not what I see others in the body of Christ doing, and I try to measure up to them. The standard is Jesus. That is the goal. It's perfection. We will not measure up to it until we get to heaven. But while we're on earth, that's what we'll try to do. Now, how thoroughly did Jesus obey his commandments? He obeyed all of them. Not just nine out of the ten, but ten out of the ten. And again, we realize that the ten are just a summary. There are many others. Jesus loved what was right across the board. His obedience was absolutely universal. Do you realize that if Jesus had failed in one point anywhere, if he would have told a white lie, if he would have shaded the truth, made things look better, boasted. If he had done anything that we often find ourselves doing, he would have failed to save himself. He would have been condemned for his sins, but he could not have saved us. He was perfect. He obeyed everything. And that is, if we love him, Jesus says, we will do the same thing. We will strive to obey him in all areas. Was the love of Jesus merely a superficial love? Uh, no, Jesus loved his Father from the heart. He didn't just go through the motions trying to keep up appearances when he was in public, you know, and before his disciples, he was, you know, always doing what was perfectly right and straight as an arrow, but when he was in private, he was an entirely different person. No, Jesus was consistent in everything and in every place. He did what he did out of love at all times and always sought for His Father's glory and everything. If we love Jesus, Jesus says, we will do the same. Again, when and where did Jesus obey Him? He obeyed Him at all times and in all places. He wasn't different in one place than another. Jesus was consistent. And then how extensively did He obey Him? Well, again, He applied the law of God to every area of His life from the very beginning to the very end. Early on, we see that Jesus continued to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. The, the way that he did that was by studying. He studied his Father's Word. He didn't just avoid those parts that he you know, didn't want to think about, but he faced head-on everything that was said, even the difficult parts. He wanted to know what honored his Father, and when he found out what it was, he sought to live by it. The fact that he grew in wisdom means that Jesus actually learned in his human nature. He didn't come into this world with, with infinite knowledge in his human nature. He learned things, and as he learned his Father's will, he sought to live by that will. Every thought that he had, he made sure it was honoring to the Lord. Every word that he spoke, he wanted to make sure that it was something that would please his Father. Every desire of his heart, everything that he did, he loved the Lord his God with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, and all his strength, and he loved his neighbor as he loved himself. Now, if we love him, 
Jesus says, this is what we will do. We will keep his commandments and we will strive to do it in the same way that Jesus did because that is the desire that is in our hearts. Now let me just say again, none of us are going to be able to do it perfectly like Jesus and God knows that. That's why we need to be confessing our sins. But that will be our goal and we will do everything we can to try to reach it, at least in our best moments. We know we fail short in many different ways uh, and we need God's grace, but He will give it to us. Now, I want to just mention this because there's a whole lot of other text here that we didn't deal with. I want you to know that Jesus in the rest of this text makes a promise to His disciples and He makes a promise to us of an either, uh, I should say, an even greater outpouring and provision of His Holy Spirit so that we might love Him and obey Him more. What, the condition the disciples were in when Jesus spoke these things to them was not the condition that they would be in in just a very short time and it's not the condition that we are in today. We have something that Jesus has given within us that will help us love Him in this way. So this evening we're going to consider more about that outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost because I believe that's what Jesus is referring to in the rest of this text. Now let me just simply say in, in closing that if you don't know this kind of love that Jesus is talking about here, if you don't have this desire for this kind of obedience, it's because you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've already seen, if you don't trust Jesus from the heart, if you don't receive Him by faith and embrace Him as your Lord and your Savior, far from seeing heaven, the only thing you will see is hell. And, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear that, and, and some would conceive of that as not a very gracious or loving thing to say, but it's really the most loving thing you can say if it's true. Because you don't want, we don't want anyone to end up in hell. We want to see them saved. So the reason I bring this up is if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ from the heart, if you're not, uh, which is shown basically by you're not obeying Him, that is your destination unless you turn away from your sins, look to Jesus Christ in faith, and put your trust in Him. Jesus offers Himself again this morning to you as a Savior, and He offers to give you everything that you need in order to be saved, in order to trust Him, in order to, well, to be forgiven of all your sins and to see heaven. But you need to look to Him. You do need to ask Him. You do need to reach out to Him in faith and receive Him, believe in Him. Jesus says, believe on Him and you will be saved. He won't turn you away. He will receive you openly. So if you don't know Him, and if you know you don't know Him because you're not trusting Him, if you don't love Him, come to Him and ask Him for that love. Ask Him for His Spirit to give you that love that you may trust Him and that you may be saved. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us um, to apply what we've just heard, uh, that we might be saved if we don't know Jesus or that we might love Him and serve Him more if we do.